So I'll just give everyone a minute to get in and get settled. So hello everyone and welcome to Aspiring Barristers event, Parenting at the Bar. My name is Clara and I'm a third year law student at Arden University and an ambassador for Aspiring Barristers. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to introduce the panel. Welcome to Mary Pryor QC from the 36 Group, Anneli Howard from Moncton Chambers, Charlotte Davis from KBG, Tahina Akta from College Chambers, Dermot Keating from 25 Bedford, Bedford Row, and Stephen Ward from Clark's Room. So a warm welcome to all of you. So let's get to know our panelists a little bit better. Um, Mary, could you tell us a little bit more about your journey to the bar and about being a parent barrister? I'm going to try and keep this very brief, Clara, because when you get to my age, your journey is a long one. So um, I went to the bar, to the um, self-employed bar with a two-year-old, a one-year-old and a baby. Um, I'd got the opportunity to take um, early redundancy, very early redundancy from a Crown Prosecution Service where I'd done my pupillage and spent six years. And I joined the Crown Prosecution Service because at the time that I did pupillage, you had to pay to do pupillage and you had to pay for your accommodation and travel. And there was no way I was able to do that because I come from a very ordinary background. Um, my dad was a coal miner. My mum worked in a factory. I grew up in a council house. Um, when my dad broke his back when I was five, we lived on benefits for a long time. So um, the profession was not, I thought, for someone like me. So I went to the bar with three small children and I have two more since then. Um, my children are now between the ages of 28 and 18, uh, five boys, all gorgeous and amazing, obviously. And um, I, when I went to the independent bar, I applied to every set of chambers that I could find. I got over 40 rejections. Um, I got one acceptance from a very small set of chambers called Clock Chambers in Wolverhampton, which had quite a poor reputation. I didn't care. I was determined to succeed. I went there. I was working in the magistrate's court and I built up a practice. And having built up a practice, I was headhunted, went to the 36th group in London and from there took silk. And I'm now a part time judge. I'm um, also vice chair of education for Greys. And this year, for reasons only those people who voted for me will know, I'm Woman of the Year in the Women in Law Awards for the United Kingdom. So that's my little journey. Thank you, Mary, such an amazing journey every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anneli, let's come to you. Time to unmute, sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, I... Well, I certainly didn't know whether I wanted to go to the bar when I was doing my A-levels. And I think that's the critical point for a lot of people about going into the law. Um, I ended up doing a law degree by accident and I simply decided I couldn't afford as much as I really wanted to go to the bar. I simply couldn't afford it. Um, uh, being one of six kids and my parents had already supported me enough. Um, and I was also attracted by the glamour of kind of the international law firm. So I got a training contract with a, a city law firm. And I then went and worked in Luxembourg and Europe for a few years for the EU. And it was while I had that time out that I thought about following my original passion and thought if I don't go to the bar, then I never would take that risk. So I decided to retrain and convert from being a solicitor to a barrister. Um, but I, I'd already had about eight years PQE at that point. I was already quite long in the tooth 
And of course, going to the bar, none of that really counts. Uh, being a solicitor isn't being a proper lawyer, apparently, or it wasn't at that stage. So I had to start from the beginning again at the age of, um, of 32. And so for me, parenting was very much intertwined with my early years at the bar because the clock was ticking against me and I had to get on with it. Um, I was also at that stage, I think I was about the fifth woman in chambers, but only the second to have a baby. Uh, and all our classroom was male at the time. So it was an interesting journey. I had, did have times where my childcare failed and I had to take the children into the classroom and ask them to multitask. <laughs> and it's been a kind of upwards curve in, in learning for both of us, both Clarks and, and for myself at the same time. But that's, that's where I'll stop and I'll let the others speak. Thank you. Already proven that there's so much support there already before we even begin. It's great. So I'll pass it over to Tahina. Well, hello. Um, so I'm a daughter of a steel worker from the north, and I come from a very traditional, stereotypical Asian background where if you were going to go to university, you either became a lawyer or a doctor, preferably a doctor or married one. And I had a, unfortunately grew up in a community where really girls didn't go to university at all. So when I um, I got an offer at Cambridge. Uh, had the good grades and my mum said okay fine if you want to do a good university and I became a barrister because I was just stubborn I was told you can't become a barrister throughout the whole time university school everywhere I applied for LPC BVC Harvard for um, my degree because fortunately I had the grades and I thought oh, maybe I could do this I was told no you can't be a barrister so fast forward I um, did pupillage at Exeter mainly because I wanted to be a barrister and I applied everywhere coming from Scunthorpe a very northern still working town. Um, I ended up in Exeter, probably one of the few tanned people uh, in Devon at the time. I remember being uh, very noticeable, but that helped me in my career. People sort of remembered who I was. Manchester, fast forward now, I'm in Southampton uh, and I love it. But I have to say, in terms of parenting, I delayed having a child until seven years call just because I was fearful and we'll talk about that more later in terms of the impact it would have on my career I just thought well I've worked so hard to get where I am I can't have a child I can't have a child now maybe that will impact things um I have two now so a nine-year-old and a two-year-old so I can tell you all about the sleep tonight sleepless nights again so I'll, I'll end there for now thanks Hina and we'll cross over to Charlotte hi um everyone I'm Charlotte um I'm a civil barrister I'm in Cornwall, been a civil barrister for about 14 years. Um, and um, uh, last year I was appointed as a deputy district judge and a uh, first tier tribunal judge sitting in the mental health jurisdiction. Um, I grew up in Luton. Uh, my mum's from an immigrant family. Um, as the same as the other panelists already said, I was told it would be um, utterly uh, impossible to, to, be a, to become a barrister from my, my background. Um, my mum um, grew up in a very poor council house area. Um, she met and got engaged to my dad when she was 14. Um, has me very young as well. Um, I uh, married quite young myself and had two children um, in my very early 20s. And um, that marriage was very, very difficult. And um, as time has passed, I found it more easy to talk about, but um, it was a very difficult um, domestic abuse uh, situation uh, which I managed to extricate myself from. Um, so I've since remarried and inherited five lovely stepchildren so I now have seven altogether um, ranging from 19 to um, eight. Uh, so I wasn't quite anticipating having uh, adult stepchildren in my early 30s but <laughs> there we are, life surprises us at every turn. Um, so I, I, yeah I feel quite well placed to offer some, some Good advice on the bar and parenting. Um, just a little bit about my education. So I went to a poor state, a very poor failing state school that was in Ofsted Special Measures. Um, I got the grades uh, that I needed to do law at university. I went to Bristol University. Um, from there I went to London. So I was still in Luton at the time actually and then did my BBC in London. And then uh, with the breakdown of my marriage, my parents had moved to Cornwall. A couple of years prior to that so I moved with the children to to Cornwall to be near them and to have a look back everyone thought I was absolutely crazy leaving a London uh, sort of commercial civil chambers um, but actually Cornwall is absolutely beautiful my children go to a lovely little village school um, and uh, I found actually the provincial bar and chambers have been extremely understanding of parenting um, and all those 
difficult things you have to juggle. Um, so yeah, no, I'll stop there because uh, once I get started <laughs> talking about parenting and all the things that have happened to me, I tend to keep talking. So I'll stop and let the others introduce themselves. Thanks, Charlotte. And we'll move across to Dermot. Sorry, just waiting for it to unmute. Well, I'm not sure I could even um, compare with any of those very powerful summaries. My, I'm a, I came over from Ireland age 14, so immigrants, new country, a new city. Um, grew up in one of my teens in London. Went to a, a really rough state school. We used to have the police van outside at lunchtime, and I think about two or three people got GCSD grade C and above, went to do my A-levels, and I applied to, at university, rather like what Anneli was saying, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do, I applied to do management studies, and then I changed my mind over the summer to say I'd like to try and do what law, and I was put in, the, I went to Brunel, went to the Runnymede campus, and right beside where the Magna Carta was signed, not, I was standing there for a year, I never actually went to see where the Magna Carta was signed, which is to my uh, shame, quite frankly, um, did a sandwich degree, so that's that was that was quite helpful for me. Did a sandwich degree, worked in a solicitor's firm, saw a lot of the courts, lots of advocacy, and that really helped me. But again, as a theme which has been said um, by others, I was a bit stubborn. It would have been easier for me to get a training contract in a solicitor's firm, but I, I wanted to be a barrister to be in a position where I thought could make most of the difference. So I went straight into pupillage, and I've been there for I was pupillage and called bar in '97. So. Um, I was very young. I was 22 or something when I was a barrister, so running around literally a proper baby barrister. And we didn't have children until I was 35. So and we've got two children, age 12 and nine. Um, I do crime, so I suppose my perspective is a little bit different, seeing how the bar has changed. It's transformed a lot. So there's a lot more to go over the last 20 odd years, but also how to cope and deal with parenthood when you're in court a lot. And that's what I was doing quite a lot when the children were younger. So I'm gonna stop there as well. Thanks, Dermot. And last but no means least, we're gonna come over to Stephen Ward. Hello, good evening. So I'm Stephen Ward. I'm Managing Director of Clark's Room. We're a, um, what you might call a virtual barrister's chambers with 200 members and 25 staff. Um, I uh, went to uh, the most horrendous school you could ever go to just outside Brighton, um, which burnt down soon after I left and they never did bother to rebuild it. Um, I was never interested in school. I left when I was 16, um, started a business and uh, got asked very soon afterwards, would I like to go to London and work in the temple? Uh, to which I replied that religion really wasn't my sort of thing. So I wasn't really interested. Uh, my dad pointed out that temple is where lawyers are and you could get to push a trolley around the temple. So I went for an interview at Three Sergeants Inn uh, with Arthur Milden QC, got the job, um, ended up Atkin Chambers and then a short spell in Manchester and then down in Taunton, so near, near uh, Charlotte in Exeter. Um, in 2001, I just basically was uh exacerbated i think is the right word with the way that chambers meetings were running um we had a, a i had two small children at the time and we were arguing about whether we could afford a carpet till 11 o'clock at night and i just decided there was a better way to run a chambers so i left uh handed my notice in the next morning set up clark's room and basically clark's room is the only um chambers in the country that is uh, 50 percent owned by clark um, so Clark and Barrister uh, run Chambers and we have a very simple motto we want to work in a pleasant environment with pleasant people uh, and the rest of it is just all about being professional so that's where I come from very very sort of middle class standard family upbringing if you like um, got married when I was got engaged when I was 18 married when I was 21 uh, and my two boys have uh, both finished uni and moved out of home and in fact both now work for Clark's Room in our finance team. So a um, bit of a family business coming on there. So that's me. <laughs> Fantastic, Stephen, thank you. So we're gonna go straight into the questions. Um, so finding out you are pregnant is meant to be an exciting and happy time. Looking back on your own experiences, how did you all feel about telling colleagues and Chambers and Clark's 
and you know that is directed to to Dermot and Stephen as well and and looking at difficulties that other people faced in that as well so Tahina I'll come to you first Sorry about that, just waiting to intervene. Um, the first time around, as I mentioned in my introduction, I um, I have to say I hid it for ages. I didn't tell my clerks until the very last minute, until I was actually showing as far as pregnancy. I think I was just very young. I, like Dermot, I started at 22 and I was just concerned that it would affect my practice. It would affect um, whether I'd get work, um, naive, probably wrongly in terms of whether the clerks would put pressure on me or treat me as different. So I'm a mum and therefore I would be weak somehow and not be able to work. Um, the second time round, so of course, as I said, my daughter's only two, so that was very recent, much more mature, and I was just more in control. So this time round, I sort of told them what I wanted to do, told them what I wanted to do as far as return to practice, all of those things. So yes, first time round, very anxious. Um, but second time around, I felt a bit more in control because that's what I wanted. It's, it's my life, my children, and this is how I want my practice to develop. So I think it's mindset really in knowing uh, and being confident in terms of um, your chambers. But everyone has different experiences with different chambers. So I'm interested to hear what others say. Mary, can I get your view on that? Well, in relation to chambers itself, of course, it was child number four who I had to advise um, them that I was pregnant with and um, the first thing was there was a kind of face pulling because three seemed to be a lot to my clerks and there was another one coming um, and they couldn't quite work out why and there was a nervousness because I knew that they would judge me for it and they did and this is when I was in Birmingham and then there was a massive row when um, when I was seven, eight months pregnant and they wanted me to go and do a four week trial two hours from where I lived. And I had to explain why that might not be a good thing, as in giving birth in court, not an ideal scenario. And I think it was that ridiculousness that made me sit down with my chief clerk, who of course, had a partner who didn't work and who had never worked since they got married and explain to him in simple terms that I had managed my career perfectly well with three. I was likely to be able to manage my career just as well with four and that he should get off in trying to make me go to places I wasn't going to go to. And so I wasn't I wasn't nervous that I wouldn't be able to cope or that he would be difficult so much as um, just that little nerve that comes from having to, to put your foot down a bit, which is not easy with clerks until you get used to doing it. So what's your view on that, Stephen, as a, as a clerk? Um, you've had a very successful career as a clerk. And, you know, what, what's your experience of that and what have you seen? And and how have barristers been supported when expecting? I, 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 you know, on reading your list of questions, the, the answer to them all before you start, and I just want to be clear about this, is it's incredibly difficult. Um, you know, it, it, each question is probably a two hour discussion, you, you, you know, on its own, and I accept that. The, I, I, ever since I've been a senior clerk, uh, which is, you know, 30 years or whatever, I have always taken the view that you celebrate um, these things when they come along. Um, I think it's very difficult for a clerk quite often, and, and, and I know who you're talking about, I know who Mary's talking about. Um, it's very difficult for a clerk sometimes to separate the chamber's pressures, the, the, the keeping your solicitors happy pressures, and they don't always look at the barristers as a, a, as a person. Um, I, I'll be completely honest with you. I did, a, I did a circular round chambers to say, these are the questions, has any got any, any views? Um, I had about 37 answers, all of them incredibly positive. Um, but one, uh, one of our um, female barristers replied and said, well, I didn't feel supported at all when I came back. So, you know, I'm going to put my hands up and say, you know, I don't think any chambers or any clerk is perfect. Um, but the the answer to the question is if if 
you know, you, you, you absolutely must um, talk to the clerks. Um, and I think it's, I, I really don't think it makes any difference whether it's a, a, a female or a male. If you're a, a parent who's affected, I mean, we're finding more and more uh, men at the bar now uh, are completely joint co-parents and therefore, um, you know, it makes no difference. Your, 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 your parenting policy is the same no matter what. So the answer to your question is, is, is you must talk to the clerks. Um, I can't be responsible for how some clerks will react and they will react in the way that Mary has said, um, because there's there's just all different pressures all around, and it's it, it it's incredibly difficult. But if you if if you really are having a dreadful experience in your chambers, the, the answer is probably you're in the wrong chambers, uh, and you need to go somewhere where you are supported. So, mm. you know, it, it. But as I said, it, it it's really difficult, really difficult. So coming across the derma, obviously you're. Uh... You're our dad barrister here. So how, what's it like for you? Obviously, I, I heard the comment that you had to bring your child to Cubs. So there are all of those um, responsibilities that come with it. So what support do you get from Chambers as a dad? I think things have changed dramatically, really. Um, it's probably different. I'm not a primary care, so it's, uh, I wouldn't, put myself in the, in the position of, of knowing how it would be speaking to the clerks if I was saying I'm, I'm pregnant and I'm going off in the worries about practice which are all very valid. Um, my experience in, this, in that the cl clerks as, a, as an entity as, and chambers have changed so much. Um, our clerks room is pretty much 50% female now. Um, everyone has children so there's that understanding. Generally if you've got it They'll try and place you for cases near where you live and they will have a conversation with you beforehand if you're going to do a case away from your home. Um, and they are, they are pretty good now, especially at return to practice, which you may move on to, but they're, they're something that to, to try and really incorporate. Um, an example, I think, um, just Mary was talking about being sent by the clerks somewhere away and having to stand up saying, I don't want to do a trial seven months pregnant. Now, I had a, a pupil, former pupil of mine, who was seven months pregnant, and there was complications as things happen at that stage, and she didn't want to be going to court. And she contacted me and said, look, this is a situation, you're on inquiry, is there any reviewing or anything I can do? And within two days, she was at home, earning money, doing reviewing work. And I think that's probably an example of how things have changed, that people are able to have that conversation, and it's normal to try and accommodate. And, assist each other um, through pregnancy and returning to work. Thanks, Dermot. And I'm going to come across to Nelly as well um, about your own experiences about becoming a parent at the bar. Well, I think, I mean, I've got three children and I had them in very close succession because I, I was older when I came to the bar. I mean, I'm, a, I'm quite an open person. So the idea of trying to hide things for for months and, and just announce it um, was probably not my style. But I mean, I was, mine was an unusual one because I actually had a miscarriage before for my first child and I had an ectopic pregnancy and was rushed into hospital. So, and I had to move things in my diary. So I had to tell the clerks what was going on and they were hugely sympathetic. They moved everything. And, but in some ways, uh, despite that sort of traumatic introduction to parenting, it, it really smoothed the way for when I did become pregnant because they were overjoyed when I told them that I was then pregnant with my first and in fact I remember one standout moment I was in the middle of a massive con after I'd had my first and um, I'd rushed from a previous con I'd grabbed a kind of Asian takeaway I won't mention the name but it, I started being sick in the middle of my con <laughs> And I had to ring the clerks to get me out and to explain that I wasn't very well. And my clerks immediately assumed I was pregnant, which of course I wasn't. But I thought that was really indicative of the way they all, they did leap to my defence and managed it. And then I did have another amusing anecdote when I was, came, uh, we have a practice that before you go away on um, pregnancy, you have a, a business development meeting so that you manage your pregnancy and what kind of work you want to do, whether it's just paperwork rather than being in court. But also while you're on maternity leave, a part of your keeping in touch days. Again, we have a, a sort of a business development meetings at irregular intervals that then prepares you for when you come back to practice. And 
I um, got very pregnant with my third child very quickly and unexpectedly after my second. And I went to my BDM and the clerks were really excited. They were saying, you know, don't worry, the, the client's still asking for you. There's reams of work for you when you come back and this is happening and that's happening and that's happening. And I sort of had to say, oh, it's just one slight pre problem. <laughs> <laughs> which you can imagine they sort of had some expletives but in a very jokey way <laughs> because they'd been trying to gear up for my return and then I said well I'm only going to be back for a few months before I go off again but that was very received in very very good humor and um, although there might have been some rumblings from older members of chambers uh, certainly not from the clerks and and not from um, kind of the support staff and in fact I've been very lucky with clients because a lot of my clients are female and they've been going through the same thing. So when we've been pregnant together and been taken out to drinks or celebrations on cases, we've both been covering for each other. So <laughs> we're sharing the uh, the tonics rather than the gin and tonics and not letting anyone else know. So it's been a, quite a positive experience for me. Great, and Nelly, and over to Charlotte. Obviously, obviously, you've got a blended family now, mm -hmm. um, but going to the bar and becoming a barrister and having your own children, what was that experience like for you? Um, so it was very difficult. Oh, sorry, it's very different um, both times because I had each child at a different chambers um, and very, very different experiences. Um, the first, my first child was, was born um, eleven years ago. Um, and I became pregnant about eight to ten weeks into my tenancy. Um, I was petrified actually to tell them and as it turned out rightly so um, because the reaction was uh, absolutely appalling um, actually. Um, I should say this as I say this is over a decade ago um, and I've had a very positive experience since then but um, yes it was a it was a very difficult time for me as I said at the beginning obviously I was going through a very difficult time myself um, and to have that added added on to by uh, my head of chambers putting his head down on the desk um, when I told him I was pregnant uh, and for him to tell me he was very disappointed in me. Um, didn't exactly help the situation, let's put it that way. Um, I, yes, my, um, my clerk uh, put four weeks off in my diary for my due dates um, without any consultation with me. Um, it was it was very 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 difficult time and it also contributed actually to to me leaving um that chambers um in fact that chambers no longer no longer ex exists anymore um if anybody wants to know which chambers it was they can have a look at my linkedin profile um but they don't exist anymore and, and as i say I, the second time round with my with my daughter um a couple of years later um was was much more positive but i was even more petrified to tell them um because of the experience i'd had the first time around but they were absolutely fantastic um and uh, i was essentially told you know really they were really happy for me um and they said look you can handle your practice however you want to however long you want to have off and um, we'll keep in touch um you know you want to come back a certain number of days a week you want certain sorts of work we'll, 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 you know and nothing is going to be too much of a problem um they had a um, maternity policy which they sent to me um it was it was fantastic actually and it really did restore my faith um in the bar uh, and children um so yes yeah, so i don't want that first experience i want to be honest about it but i don't want it to put anybody off because i i like to think that given my second experience and given that these sort of um, meetings are, are going on and you talk to lots of people coming through now at the bar that that sort of experience is not happening anymore. I truly, truly hope it isn't. Um, so I, I don't want that to put anybody off, but I think it's a good indication of how far things have come actually within just the space of the last, the last decade. So yeah, that was my, my experience of having my two. Thanks Charlotte. And how do you know colleagues chambers and clerks what support is in place now what is there for parents obviously we've gone through the pandemic children are being homeschooled so tahina could you shed a little bit okay. of light? so a bit like charlotte i had two different experiences because both my children were i was at different chambers and um, i think my first one I probably didn't feel um, very supported at all, being young, not wanting to disclose a pregnancy, the pressures of the clerks, all those things I hear from Mary and Ellen and Charlotte, all of that applied to me. And I was just this very young, nervous barrister in terms of career. Um, I was having a trajectory in terms of work and there was I, shining star, and how could I just stop, put a break on everything? And that's how my clerks sort of felt at the time. However, 
Uh, and I remember the first um, Chambers, uh, there was a comment that really stuck in my mind. I returned to work at seven months and I was a male colleague. And again, it's just one example. It doesn't mean it's across the board. And he just said to me, oh, you've abandoned your child, have you? And that sort of mum guilt that you have, as we all have, it just played on. I said, what am I doing? Why am I at work? I, maybe I should be at, um, at home. Maybe I'm being judged. So that probably didn't feel very supportive at all. But now, uh, fast forward to where I am, I think my current chain was, everything works well, much more support I had planned. I spearheaded the sort of maternity policy we have in chambers now. And also as far as the youngsters, we do um, sort of chats and briefings in terms of when they go to go on maternity leave, what do they expect to return, having a business plan for chambers, so all of those things. Uh, and just being a bit more healthy talking about it, that it's okay to be pregnant and to go off and return. And if you want to have a full career again, that's fine. If you want to work part-time, that's fine too. Um, I suppose, I think in terms of support, we're a bit more supportive and let's just be less judgy. That's probably my, not my point. Um, yeah, so I think things have improved. It may be different uh, chambers, um, but it may just be passage of time that we are better at having these conversations and talking about it. Thanks, Sahina. And that mum guilt is definitely real, Mary. How did you feel having your children and the guilt of it? And then what support was there for you? Hmm. Um, so far as support is concerned, uh, when I had my fourth child, none. Um, when I had my fifth child, some. Um, but key, I think, is to remember that um, things have moved on dramatically since 18 years ago when I had my last child. Um, and the first thing that's changed is that there are more women at the top of the profession. And so there are people within chambers that women can go to who have experienced what they're beginning to experience. There's also a large number of groups for women within the various disciplines. So women in criminal law, women in family law, who can offer mentors and supporters if you are going through pregnancy or maternity leave and you want some guidance or support and you don't want to ask anyone within your own set. Also, the clerk's room looks very different than it did 20 years ago. Um, I have a female practice manager and there are um, a large number of women now who are involved in clerking. So that does make a different um, atmosphere from the atmosphere that used to be in a clerk's room because um, the women there also have children and understand the processes. But key to all of this, I think, is the fact that any chambers worth its salt, any chambers who wants to progress, wants to keep women at the bar. And there is such a attrition rate for junior women leaving the bar that any decent set of chambers is desperate to do everything it can to support its junior women, to make sure that they take the time they need to have maternity leave, have a practice plan in place for when they come back, have a good maternity policy and a good clerking team behind them so that um, they can move forward. As to guilt, I can deal with this very straightforwardly because I have the benefit of hindsight, which those of you who have young children do not have. And um, rather like Charlotte, I had a very unhappy marriage. Um, well, so the father of my children um, was not what you would call husband of the year. Putting him to one side, if I may, for a moment, um, as a result of that, I was the only breadwinner and I do crime. So I had to work long hours uh, and often at short notice. So when my youngest child reached 18, I sat them all down and asked them to forgive me for my absences during the course of their growing up and explain to them how guilty I felt about not being able to take them to each and every party or to, to be at each and every event that they um, took part in. 
and um, they looked astounded at me. All five of them just looked at me utterly astounded and said, mum, for heaven's sake, that wasn't the problem at all. Now you will understand from that comment, there was a problem, but it wasn't that I wasn't there for each and every event. Physical presence is not what the children required. What, when I was there, I made sure that they had my time and they were very happy with that time. They were happy with the quality. They didn't necessarily need the quantity. But um, there were a number of complaints. I'll give you two of them and we haven't got enough time for all of them, obviously. The first was that I bought them all what I thought was a rather fetching matching set of cardigans. Um, they were apparently not cool, uh, even though they were John Lewis, which in fairness, you know, that's a lot of money for five cardigans. They were an absolute no and have still not been forgiven for those cardigans. And secondly, I always insisted that each of my children invited everyone in their class to a birthday party. And there were some people in those classes who my children did not like. And I can tell you their names because they were they were sent out to me in rote um, with, with that face, you know, that you get when it's, and you made me ask Frank is one in particular. Uh, Frank spent the entire party hiding under my dress, just in case you want to know. So the guilt that we feel is actually not not right because children aren't concerned that you're not always there they're just concerned that when you are there you are there thank you mary and anelli glad to get your take on that um i mean i found i mean being pregnant was not a problem for me i felt i had supercharged energy and i could i was in court um, you know a week before my third c-section <laughs> madly the problem i found is that the system is not set up for parenting and I, I found my journey as a parent very very lonely because there were very few women at my level who were going through that experience the men in chambers or colleagues i work with outside chambers were not juggling two roles and had their, most of them had their wives at home doing everything so i likened it to trying to climb a rock face with made of shale where you're slipping every time you get another finger hole in you slip backwards and you're climbing this huge obstacle with a great big basket on your back full of name taping and world book day prizes your costumes and halloween costumes and party invitations and all this extra emotional load that you have to carry at the same time of trying to climb up this silly hill that you don't really realize wonder why you're climbing it in the first place and i just found very much that i was a a square peg in a round hole for much of my early years as a parent and then I luckily because I've been a solicitor and I've still got that those networks of um, friends who are in law firms or have now moved into GLD or the civil service you know I would talk to them and compare my experience with the experiences that they were having and I realized there was a sort of um, conspiracy of silence where nobody actually talks about it and uh, I mean, that seems alien now because everybody's talking about it now, of course, but even even five years ago, you know, you were just told to suck it up and get on with it. And, you know, don't make a fuss because you'll be a troublemaker and you don't want to sort of be branded as a feminist. But I thought, well, like, this is never going to change unless somebody said something. And one of the hardest things I've found is not being the clerks or your colleagues or the clients who've been very, very supportive. It's been the kind of court deadlines and the judicial attitudes to you know because obviously they've got a timetable they want to get on with the case they want to be efficient but often the deadlines would just fall either flat bang in the middle of um school holidays or you'd be given overnight deadlines that you know you'd be preparing your cross-examination till 11 o'clock or midnight anyway and then they would say oh miss howard could you just do me a little note on this or how about a little research note on that the boys never got given the homework it was always the school prefect head girl that was given the homework even when I was heavily pregnant. So it was those attitudes that I found more difficult to, to counter because obviously there's a power imbalance between the advocate and the judge. And in the end, I just thought, well, actually, I'm just going to be upfront about this. So when I was given deadlines for like the, the 3rd of January, I'd say to the judge, I'm really sorry, but, you know, Father Christmas doesn't exist, but mothers do. And Christmas is a hell of a time for the working 
parents because you've got all the, the, the presents and the family expectations of what the wife is meant to be doing over Christmas. Plus you're expecting me to draft my skeleton when I've got no childcare. And I remember coming out of court that day and somebody saying, oh, that was very brave. You're very brave to say that. And of course I didn't get the extension, but I thought at least I'm making the point, it's raising awareness of it. So, and now I think things have changed because whether it's Me Too or whether it's just the culture shift but, um, and the pandemic I think is helping, people are discussing this and women are comparing and, and learning from each other and their experiences. And I think the major thing in Chambers now is that we've just adopted a formal mentoring program. It was always done on an ad hoc informal basis, but then people were scared of ever really taking it up. And now we've got a formal mentoring program, not just to deal with parenting, but to deal with other issues as well. But we are actively trying to coach our junior tenants so that they can apply for i'm in public law but they can apply for government panels and we're helping them say right you've got a gap in your cv here you're not going to get on the panel unless you do this and that really helping them to prepare those applications and helping them with the journey through parenting um, particularly in the early years um, quickly in terms of guilt I'm a terrible one for maternal guilt. I'm, I mean, I was one of six and my mother worked full time and she ran multiple businesses. So part of me feels I've got to live up to her expectations and her standards. But at 15, I said I wasn't going to have children because there's no point having them if you don't see them. I was quite bitter to my mother. Of course, I didn't understand. And I carried that with me, which is one of the reasons I ironically, I moved to the bar because I knew I wanted a family and I I wanted to have time to be with my children. Um, and I really have to run a tight ship. I live outside London, so I used to have to commute. And I've really battled to carve out the time at the weekends to be with them. And that's, you have to draw your red lines. One silk in chambers who I asked for help as a, a she said, you've got to draw your red lines of where you're prepared to work and you've got to learn to say no. And so my red line is, and unless I'm in court on the Monday, I don't work weekends and that is the time for my children. It means of course I never relax and I never actually get any rest. Um, and I'm trying to, I always try and make sure that if I can't be with them in the week, then we, we do something fun at the weekends. Um, and so that, and that seems to work. And I, the other thing I do is to build in kind of regular breaks when I can, not always all of half term, but some time at half term to go and do something fun together. Nelly. I'm just going to read out a tweet and then I, I want to come to Dermot and Stephen. Um, this tweet was put out by a barrister. Just asked a Crown Court judge not to list a case on my little guy's first day of school. Quite right, Mr. Chi. Can't miss that. Can everybody do next Friday? So as a dad, what's it like? Because obviously times have changed from, you know, mom's having to be at home and and dad's being the breadwinners. You're quite an active parent, Dermot, and I'm sure Stephen, you are as well. So what's it like for dads? Well, I think we got far easier, to be honest. I think far easier now. I don't think I would ever complain about the, the plight of being a dad. Um, I, I suppose there's probably different stages of parenthood. Um, I, my wife um, was working full time um, after the first and second went back to school. So when they're both going to nursery, it's easier and in, to an extent, it's dropping them off early. It's amazing how early it is actually. And that's sort of challenging. One can do the morning, one do do the pickup. So there can be that sort of co-parenting at that stage. And that's, again, you have to be ruthlessly efficient. It becomes more trickier when um, the children go to school and, and preschool and, and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's the sort of different stage of parenthood, how challenging it becomes. Um, I think picking up on what Anneli said is 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 really really pertinent. Is that red lines are being honest? That the challenge of being this self-employed barrister is that you always got the other voice in your head about this case. And I should I turn down the work? Should I do this case? And what I learned to do was I would always book off the two weeks around Christmas, and I would always try and book off two weeks, really a year in advance for the summer. And they were block booked and there were always would be cases, this big case, this big case, and it always would come in there. But I, I would try not do those cases or it would be a family discussion about me not doing those cases. I suppose the other point would be is going forward, that's being honest with yourself, but also is that I encourage, uh, use a parallel with pupillage, pupils a lot of time won't take time off because they're afraid to ask. 
you have to encourage people to, to be able to ask and actually say you have to take time off. I think we need to be like that with, with, with parenting as well and really um, have the conversations. Um, I'm not sure I would ask a judge not to sit because it's my son's first birthday and that's probably our first day at school and that probably is is my failing I probably should do and I think there's always that battle as a parent should you ask you know I've missed sports days and other things as well and other times I've been lucky but it's sometimes trying to be a bit more proactive is probably the, the, the lesson to be learned. Thanks Emma. and I'm going to come over to Stephen obviously oh. you're quite a an integral part of a barrister's successful career and if they have commitments they need you to work with them on that so how do clerks really support parents both mothers and fathers i'm going to start by saying the same as i did last time it's really difficult <laughs> um, there's going to be a theme here to my answers um from from my perspective i think I, I do look at this from a slightly different perspective. It, it, at the end of the day, I'm managing the clerk's room with 200 barristers and what we need this, I think the best way of me trying to explain this is there's two sides to any discussion that takes place. You've got, you've got to have a clerk who's sensible, uh, backed by chambers. All of my clerks uh, have the full backing of chambers to do whatever it takes. Um, I like to think that we are uh, as good as we can be with these sorts of things and, and flexible as, as possible. The other, I think the other thing, I, I mean, I might be being slightly controversial here, but the other thing to bear in mind is that us clerks who have been clerks for many, many years, we, we sometimes have to be cruel to be kind in order to help the person. You know, sometimes we might get a phone call saying, oh, um, you know, this has happened and this has happened. And we might, um, this is probably not gonna come across very well, but I'll do my best. We might, we might try to persuade somebody to do something because there is a reason for doing that. It might be the first instruction from that firm. You've talked up the barrister to the client. At the end of the day, I always say to any of our barristers, the decision is ultimately theirs. I mean, I can't, I cannot tell someone what they must do. Um, I think a lot of clerks and a lot of chambers think they can. Uh, I certainly don't think I can. I will say to a barrister, look, let me explain to you why I think this is really crucial and can we explore all the other options? Um, and sometimes it's, it, it can be a member of staff, you know, who says to me, uh, my wife's sick and a, a child's ill and I need to work from home. And it's particularly difficult for us in the office that day, but of course that's fine. But you, you sometimes have a conversation about what the practicalities are, what we'll need to do to make that happen. Because a lot of people do just sort of put their hand up and go, oh, can you sort that out for me? It's a bit inconvenient for me to do that today. And you have to say, well, look, yeah, that's fine. But we spent quite a lot of conversation six weeks ago, persuading the solicitor to use you for this case. We've told them how good you are. We've told them all this, that, and the other. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not reasons for not agreeing to somebody who has a you know if it's some if it's a child's first day at school or whatever of course but all we ask our members is to put is to, is as soon as they know if they do know is to put that in the diary because if someone has a first day at school we we, we always have a, a saying in in clerk's room is are, are you away or are you away away because if you're away away we won't ask you if, if I've got a solicitor on the phone with a brief fee of £10,000 and you're the only one available and you've put away away because it's the, um, you know, the ch child's first day at school or whatever, then you're away away. And that's we won't even ask you because we know it'll annoy you. Whereas if you just say, well, I'm away, but I might be tempted, then that's different. So it's about communication. And it's about flexibility. And it's about both the barrister and the clerk being having a sensible conversation about it. I hope, I hope that makes some sort of sense. It does most definitely make sense. Um, Charlotte, I'm going to come to you. Um, Sweden is leading the, leading the way across Europe with maternity and paternity rights, with over 400 days paid leave for mothers and 100 paid leave for paternity for fathers. Um, but when we look at it, women need that support from their partner if they have one. And 
do you think so much time off work hinders your progression even if the way the way that the UK do it now or do you think it's a good idea for fathers to take as much time off with the mother? Um, so this is quite a difficult one in the context of the bar because I would imagine that my answers would probably be very different in the employed sort of con uh, sort of context. Um, difficulty is, I mean, I so when I first had my first child, I was only a year or so into my tenancy. Um, and if I'm honest, probably my instruction sisters didn't even notice I was gone. Um, because that early on, nobody really, you know, you're, you're sort of just building your practice, to be honest. Um, you haven't really got to the point where you've got those regular instructing solicitors that you want to keep happy. You're sending you cases all the time. And um, you're kind of still in that, in the pool, um, the very, very junior barristers and there are other people who could take on the work that you couldn't do so actually the oddly um having my first child very very early on having both of them actually very early on in my in my career turned out really rather quite well um because now when I'm sort of almost 14 15 years call and I've got those regular instruction solicitors um I'm glad I've done that. I'm glad I've, I've done that. I'm over that hurdle, um, as it were, in terms of taking time off to have children. Um, and also, I don't, frankly, don't think I'd have the energy um, now, <laughs> actually. So I had youth on my side too, um, which did help. But in terms of, yeah, I think you're going to have to accept that if you are going to take time off at the bar when you are a self employed individual, where it's all about you. Um, in terms of building your practice and, and being available for work and doing the cases um, that you, you, your, your practice is going to be a bit, it is going to be a bit hindered. It, it just is. And that's just a, a fact. Um, so uh, provided you sort of prepare for that and you can accept that. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are ways, I, I imagine nowadays, actually, when you've got the, the more remote um, court hearing scenario going on, in fact, it may be slightly different context now. Perhaps you could do more from, from home, not having to actually physically go to court as much as you used to, uh, if it continues the way it is. Um, comparing the, the dads to mums, and should dads take as much time off? Well, in an, an ideal world, yes. I think it's very personal, actually, to the, to the family context as to what's right for each um, set of parents. Um, it, it, it's, it's difficult for, for me to comment on personally because like Mary, um, uh, I'm not putting words into Mary's mouth, mouth really, but my ex-husband was a um, bleep. Um, so I didn't get the support at all. Um, in fact, you know, I was, uh, yeah, well, let's not even just go there because I could just, you know, take up the next two hours <laughs> on that topic. But um, uh, but yeah, uh, so it's difficult. I, uh, yeah, ideally that would be fantastic. And I think more of an even share would have less of a burden on women's careers than it does. In fact, uh, there's one good example I can think of is actually when I was pregnant the first time in my first chambers, um, God, the trouble it caused. Um, interestingly, um, another male member of chambers wife was pregnant and he um, decided to take some time off which was no longer actually than the amount of time I ended, taken, ended up taking off. Um, but goodness me, you know, the, the me doing it for some reason seemed to, seemed to be a lot more um, difficult for Chambers to handle than, than him doing it. Um, but that again was the context of that particular Chambers. So I think in an ideal world, yes, it's, it's individual to the family context and what works best for you. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably as, as much as I can answer on that one. Thanks, Charlotte. And Tahina, what's your views on that? Right. So um, uh, my family actually featured in the BBC last year on this topic because my husband, um, with my first child, he, he was a city banker. He was working lots. And in the first two weeks when he wanted to take time off when we had our son, um, his boss wanted him in still, so no paternity leave. So he took voluntary VR um, redundancy and he took a year out with my son. Uh, and I returned to work sooner at six, seven months, because we took a decision at that time for our family it worked with me returning, not having a huge impact, slowly building back to full-time practice. And he became that dad in the 
parent and um, child group, he would actually say it's always called mums, mums and baby groups. And he would get asked all the time, are you, um, do you have a male partner or are you widowed? And, and those were the sort of views that we still had, sadly, uh, even now, probably when you have dads turning up to these things. So we had a different um, experience this time around, I suppose, financially different position, we're able to help have childcare. And yes, if you have um, the support, and I suppose my husband was at the other end of the bell curve to Mary and Charlotte's experiences from previous uh, exes, that he was around and he was a available to be very flexible. And we both have had very flexible careers uh, and everything we have done really in both of our careers has been centered around our children. So me even moving to three different regional sets as opposed to going to London. Was, on, was based around childcare, was based around children. So in an ideal world, yes, it would be great if they're uh, available all the time and you have a partner who's able to manage their career in that way to have so much time off. Um, but what I would say in terms of my experience now is that I probably work, I was reading some of the chats in terms of the questions, uh, in terms of full-time and um, part-time. I work very much full-time, but I take extensive holidays. So I take all school holidays off. Um, I take 10 to 12 weeks off, but when I do work, I work very intensely. So that's my sort of trade-off in terms of work. And it just depends on practice areas. It might not be suitable for if you're a criminal practitioner, uh, but for myself doing chancery and divorce, I'm able to do that. I have more desk space practice. So those are the things that you need to think about in terms of how you manage your childcare going forward. So the short answer is yes, great. But, um, I was able to do it, so it's great experience around. But if you read the article, it gives the impression that he did it every time, but not last time. Last time I was sent back to work and so was he. So <laughs> not quite the super daddy made up. <laughs> Thanks, Tahuna. And Dermot, um, how much time did you take off or would you have liked um, more time? Or just did the job not allow for it? it, it the circumstances both times actually were the first time um, children don't come when they're meant to come, which is another spoiler. They don't come on a due date. They're always two weeks late, which messed, up, messed, messed the diary up. Um, and the, the eldest, George, he, he came, I, I went I, about a, a week at home with no sleep. And then I went straight into four months doing a murder in a bailey. So that's, it was just, it was great. I had to work, but I didn't take any time off just because of the diary. And second time around, I had my, um, I had a judicial interview or something, sort of day four. And so I, I organised it so badly, I had to go down, stay in a hotel and go down to Bristol. This is before they were done online. So you did them in hotels. And so uh, I had my sort of, I had a, an interview for that and then I had to go into another case. So I didn't take much time off at all, actually. Um, but the one, one tip, um, because I remember looking at these questions and about paternity leave. And I was checking the law about that. And it was around when, when my children were born. But um, I think, I'm not sure there was anything if you're self-employed in any event. But um, for anybody who is a junior tenant or joining a chambers or a pupil, the chambers should have an equality, a diversity and inclusion handbook or some sort of equivalent, which includes all the policies. And we've been probably because of, like most other chambers, really looking to and um, really reinvigorates all our policies, which have been there in place for a long time, but they've probably got a little bit stale. And I've been part of the team which have been upgrading them and that includes our parent po policy. And apparently I, didn't, I wasn't aware that there, there is, we do have a policy where I could have taken parental leave and had some sort of reduction in my rents and everything else. So there's two things, one, I didn't ask and two, it wasn't publicized. So I would encourage people to ask and to look in and there is, abilities within chambers. I'm not, sh I'm sh not sure if it's at Mary's and then Ellie's set and other sets, but we, we do have a, a policy, whether it's for someone who is, um, if it's the biological child or adopted child or they're fostering, it's, 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 it's not just as, as limited as you first think that there is a way that they can take significant periods of time off and then come back on a, um, their income they would receive would be, the rent they would have to pay would be reduced. So there is things there. Thanks, Dermot. So I'm going to move on now to um, something that, that really struck a chord with me, and that's why I decided to really go ahead with this event. I've witnessed a few posts in the past few months on LinkedIn of female aspiring barristers being discouraged from taking a career at the bar seriously if they're considering starting a family. Mary, what's your views on this? 
Are you sure you want to know the answer to this, Clara? I think we do. Okay. Um, I am furious that any member of our profession takes it upon themselves to discourage someone. And it is often a sign of some inner problem with the speaker who is trying to tell people that they're not going to make it as a barrister because their eyes are too close together or they're going to have a family or they've got an accent or they didn't go to a Russell Group University or whatever else. Well, um, firstly, no one should tell you whether you can or can't become a barrister because the only person who makes that decision is you. Secondly, if you want an example of someone who shouldn't be a barrister but is, it's me. Um, I went to a polytechnic. I have five children. I brought them up almost single-handedly. It would have been easier to be a single parent because I would never have had the hope of any help. Whereas when you have someone physically present, you often hope that they're going to help you and spend a lot of time being disappointed. I've got a practice in criminal law, which again, everyone will tell you, doesn't mean you earn any money. There's no point doing it. It's utterly pointless. It's not true. Um, it is a wonderful profession. I've earned a very good living at it right through my career. And it is one of the areas where social mobility shines because people who join this profession are often people who need to join this profession. So people like me, single parents, mature students, and it's the same with family law. And I would say to you that, of course, it's difficult bringing up a family and being a barrister, but it's difficult bringing up a family and being anything. It's difficult bringing up a family and working in Tesco's. It's difficult bringing up a family and being self-employed in any kind of job. That there is no magic solution. And I would be lying if I said to you that I was like one of those um, film stars. You can see that anyway. But you know one of those people who you see on the adverts who strolls along as a size eight with a perfect bottom and perfect hair with two perfectly dressed children uh, wandering around whilst they're all eating organic, you know, carrot sticks and tofu. That wasn't my experience of parenting. Uh, and it's not the way that I've brought my children up because um, my experience isn't that experience. So it's hard. You do have to make rules that you stick to, but you can do it. And don't let anybody particularly a man but anybody tell you that you can't because you can and do you know what else it's great fun having a family is great fun and having a career is great fun you get tired but you're going to get tired whatever you do and just think of what a role model you are for your children who can see you achieve such a lot. And if anyone needs any support, then there are people all around our profession who will give it to you. Look at all these wonderful people this evening giving up their free time to talk to you, to encourage you to do it. But no one is suggesting it's easy because it's not, but it's not for anybody. So don't let anybody tell you what you can do. Just be like we are, mostly stubborn. Thanks, Mary. And now, Nelly, I'm going to come over to you with that same subject. Well, I'm quite heavily involved with the Bar Council and Grey's Inn and also with um, specialist bar associations like ALBA and BEG on, on diversity and inclusion. And there are more women joining the bar than men at the moment. I think it's, um, it's nearly 60% female. And, um, and yes, there is an attrition at 12 years, but I think that's changing. And I think events like this will help uh, to support women in, in maintaining their careers and feeling included. I think that's the big change that needs to come. I would not put anybody coming off, um, coming, put anybody off the bar 
because they want to have a family. I was put off the bar when I was at university. I was told that the bar wouldn't exist in 20 years time, that the law firms were, and the solicitor advocates were going to take over. There was no future at the bar. I mean, look where it is now, a, a fully thriving profession and many successful women. I go to court hearings and uh, competition law where the whole court is female and the judge is female, which I mean, that's, that's just a marker of how far the profession has come. Um, the last thing I would say is that also you can have law degrees dripping out of your ears and qualifications it doesn't necessarily make you a very good lawyer because law is all about communication. It's all about people skills. And my children have taught me far more in terms of my ability to be a good lawyer and to be a good time manager and the ability to, to manage teams of 20 people when I'm doing public law cases for GLD than anything that I learned at law school. <laughs> So I, th I think my children are a real asset and they make me human. They make me know my flaws on a daily basis <laughs> and i um, actually make me a better person. And I feel my life feels greatly enriched as a result of having them. And I, I wouldn't want to give up my, my career, um, but I wouldn't want to pursue a career without having a family as well. It'd be very, very boring. Um, so <laughs> I would encourage every woman who wants a family to come on and get on the bandwagon. And in fact, I don't think my junior will mind. I actually gave some mentoring support, support to a junior um, tenant. She'd just been taken on as a tenant. This is about four or five years ago. And she said she was just getting engaged. She was just getting married. And I said, have you thought about having children? And she sort of went quite embarrassed. Um, and I said, if I were you, I'd have your children straight away. I said, I, laid, I waited till I was older and it's much, A, it's much more difficult to get pregnant. Nobody tells you that, how difficult it is. But also, if you have it at a later stage, you're then juggling the full pelt of parenthood at the same time as your career is going off into the stratosphere. If you have your children while you're still in the footholes of, foothills of your career, it's much more easy to manage them. And, um, and in fact, she gave a talk recently to Alba. She has got um, three children um, under four and she's five years cool. She's in our chambers. You can probably look her up. And her career is going from strength to strength. She hasn't had any interruption. Uh, clients are just desperate for her to, to, to do work for them because she's so good. And yes, she's probably shattered as the rest of us are, but, um, but is really thriving from being a young barrister and a young parent. So I'd re I would really recommend that um, we, we need more women at the bar. We, the more that women come to the bar, the more things will change. And, and also for male barristers, we need male barristers to be working parents and take their fair share of the load as well, so that it isn't a female issue anymore. It, it is completely equal and affects all working parents, um, regardless of their gender or sexuality. Zanelle and Tahina, I'm gonna to come to you next. Oh, I absolutely agree with everything Anneli and Mary have said um, above. And, and like Anneli said, for me, um, I have the most, my most challenging adversary is probably my toddler at the moment. And she teaches me a lot as far as advocacy and negotiation, um, I tell you. So yes, of course, it's enriching. And I know from the areas I do, particularly in Chancery, if, if you've ever attended a Chancery Bar Association, you're one of the few females there, never mind, of, you know, I had the ethnicity dilemma as well, uh, uh, layer onto that as well. And there will be challenges. Uh, however, we need more of us. We just, and especially now, when you look at where we are, when I first started um, in 2004, every year of my career, I was told the bar wouldn't be here. It, it's going, it's exists, it's going away. And, and we get told that again, all the pupils coming in now are told, oh, the bar won't exist anymore. And we're still here. And I think the worst uh, weakness that we have at the bar is we just don't stand up for ourselves enough. And that's probably it, that, that is our biggest weakness. Um, so for me, I would say we have to continue, not the fight, but continue in the way that we are. It's great. There's lots of women at the top, um, people like Anali and Mary here, and still wanting to help, you know, giving up their precious time. Um, I'm now part of Bar Non, which is a Western Circuit diversity steering group. And for that, we encourage everyone from a diverse group to get involved. Um, I'm also the EDNI officer in Chambers because again, I reflected over the last year that we just need a bit more work. We need people like myself up and coming in terms of seniority to help those um, beneath us and say, actually, we do need more of us. Um, so I would say in terms of women in the bar, 
it can be done. There are lots of challenges of being a parent, like any career working parent. Um, this thing about work-life balance, maybe we just need to get rid of that terminology and use work-life harmony. Let's just have harmony in what we do and be at peace with that rather than having, striving for this balance that we're all trying to achieve. Thanks, Tahina. And I'm going to come across to Charlotte because I know, Charlotte, um, you've seen these posts as well. And I think they struck a chord. And I think, I know, and if Mary's referring to one particular person in particular, I think I know exactly who it is because I think it was one of my LinkedIn posts that he um, jumped onto and then everybody then jumped and jumped on as his social media pile on. Um, what a way to spend time procrastinating over that opinion you need to write is get on LinkedIn for half an hour. Um, but yes, I think I do know exactly who it is that you're talking about, Mary. Um, and yeah, appalling actually. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. It, 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 it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy actually. Um, and that, and that's, the, how, that's why it's so dangerous um, because if you have somebody saying, well, you, you know, you, we need to be more honest with with people. I think that was the line they were taking. It's like, you know, you're you're conning these poor students into saying that it's possible. Um, and you're kind of sitting there thinking, well, hello, it is possible, you know, doing it. Um, you know, and, and lots of other people are doing it as well. So and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it always makes you wonder whether they're actually a little bit nervous um, themselves, actually, a little bit insecure, a little bit fragile with this sort of... Um, uh, sort of domination they think they might have established over certain areas of practice or the bar or um, certain levels of seniority and you do wonder whether actually they're sort of looking at this like brave heart sort of wall of women running towards them with their babies under their arms you know feeling a little bit trembly legged <laughs> um, everybody running towards them so it does, it does do make you wonder actually about their insecurities um I think they're few and far between. Um, they do seem to shout quite loud, but they are few and far between, thankfully. Um, and they'll get stormed over um, by William Wallace, um, QC, um, or I should say Wilma Wallace, <laughs> QC. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it'll be a little bit longer before those voices are properly quelled and quietened down. But um, yeah, um, I'm one of the 2020 social mobility advocates for the Bar Council. I think they're recruiting for their 2021 ones now. Um, and part of that has been doing these, these sort of talks online and um, various interviews and sort of blog posts and things. And, you know, that's what I've been doing all year is, is, is to try and say, don't, please don't be put off by anybody telling you that you can't do something because of X, Y, Z. And for God's sake, particularly not either because you're a mum or a parent or a, you know, whatever, a female. Um, it's just absolutely not true. It's categorically untrue. And um, yeah, I would just implore anybody just to actually come and speak to the people who are actually doing it. They're probably the best ones to give you some proper, proper advice. Thanks, Charlotte. And obviously males are getting a little bit of a raw deal here because <laughs> it was a male that, that said this. So Dermot, what would you say to all aspiring barristers, parents or expectant parents, people who want to be parents in the future? What good advice can you give those for a career, realistic advice at the bar? Well, I would say that everyone who is, who is, who is listening has is, is been treated to a masterclass of inspirational women speaking um, about their experiences. I think it's brilliant. Uh, um, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. I would never discourage anybody from joining the profession. I think, Clara, you were on my, one another talk I was in. It's a fantastic profession. It's a wonderful profession. You need to make an informed decision. It's really difficult. Parenting is wonderful, but it's really difficult. You could buy both of them together. It's really difficult, but it's, it's doable. And the bar is, we want a bar which is going to be diverse um, in, in every way. And um, perhaps to give people um, a little bit of hope. When I, I mentioned I went along to, for my second son when he was born, I went along to do the judicial interview and then I, I, I was appointed. So I was 35, 36, as a first tier tribunal judge. So sort of a, a sort of starter block in terms of judicial appointments. But when I was there and I was quite chuffed that I was relatively young to be appointed, I wasn't the youngest. There was a, a lot of female practitioners who were appointed and the judiciary the female judiciary is transformed in terms of and um, its its representation there's a lot of people there who are children who are doing it and 
that fitted into their career. And then the, perhaps we're going to come back more into practice as well. So there's that's something to bear in mind as well. So in terms of tips, I would say you have to be um, honest with yourself. You have to carve out that time. Um, when the clerks come, and it is a phrase, a way away, and I have to I have to say it's one of the phrases I, I, I dislike because it's it's it puts you under so much pressure. You know, you always have that battle between a self-employed and provider and parents and are you a way away? And you have to not see the money or see something else and actually be a way away. Um, there's other tips as well is that everything's a trade-off. So um, in terms of going to solicitors functions, you don't have to be out whining and dining solicitors all the time. Um, your practice and your solicitors may, in some respects, they reflect your interests. A lot of my instructed solicitors are female because I'm not out whining and dining and they're busy because they've got children as well and there's a shared interest and they know I'm a family man and I'm working hard and it just happens. So that you, there's a way to develop a practice without having to be out every evening or most evenings. Target your time. There will be some functions you need to go to, but you can go to some and you need to be there for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. And then there's an optimum moment and you can leave. And the other point is, I think Anneli was mentioning about keeping your weekend free. And for her level of practice and her area, that's amazing time management because to do that is fantastic. It's very easy when you start off as a barrister to take a Sunday out all the time and to say, I need to work. And suddenly sort of work fills available time or non-available time as a parent. I get up at five o'clock in the morning, which I do a lot of the time and I work between five and half six before the children wake up. That works for me and means I get to see them and, and you find what works for you. You have to be quite efficient with your time management and you can't do everything. So that's all I would say. Thanks Dermot and over to Stephen. I, 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 I just, it's really, we might have been in for a bit of stick being, being the only two males here, but on the panel, but um, but it's fair. I think it. I think it is fair. I mean, I, I've I've witnessed a lot of it over the years, and you know, I, I'm not going to stand here and say it doesn't exist. It does exist. Um, it, it it was interesting earlier. I, I noted down. I wanted to go back to something Charlotte had said. You know, with the barrister putting his head on his desk, and I I actually can say hand on heart after being a clerk for 35 years, I don't understand it. I I, I really don't. I mean. You know, everybody is everybody is equal. It, it's it's really that simple. Um, and whether it's uh, I've been talking to somebody recently who has very severe disabilities, um, and so what? You know, if, if, if that person qualifies to become a barrister, and you know, uh, don't get me started on the pupillage because you know, at the end of the day, if you've got to the stage where you have completed uh, your training. Um, then we put this extra hurdle in place. I know everybody's got their views on that, but we put this extra, you know, you've got to have six months not working um, in place. And it's the same for everybody, male or female. But, you know, anybody who puts up an obstacle or, or puts a view on LinkedIn or Twitter, like whoever it was, is just, it's just ridiculous. And I think it just shows them up as being a ridiculous person. It's not, you know, there's no place for that these days. The, to me, the only advice I can give to everybody here, and I, and I know it's absolutely terrifying when you're talking to chambers about pupillages and so on, but it's just be honest, just ask the questions, just, you know, people buy people these days. And, you know, it, it, it is changing, not fast enough. It needs to change faster. Um, the bar's got a long way to go. At the end of the day, the bar is a group of self-employed individuals. They do get together in the chambers, but then most people are, pretty much equal in the chambers so you don't have the corporate identity and the corporate policy and the training that you have in a big law firm um, but the bar is the bar is getting better without doubt and sessions like this and being open to uh, talking about it and giving an insight and and being honest and frank is is the way to go whether whether some people find it quite difficult to listen to some of the things so be it you know but if you're having an open and frank conversation all the better Thanks, Stephen. And over to you, Mary. The first thing I want to say, I think, is that outdated concepts such as um, 
there is a mother and a father within a family and that it is a father who's having paternity leave, which is to support a mother, is language we all need to avoid. We're in an environment now where I hope every set of chambers understands that parents are parents and that to men, to women, or any combination of the above, or anyone who views their gender in any other way, can bring up a child beautifully. The key for me is understanding that there is support for you and being open and honest enough to ask the relevant questions as Stephen was saying, but what, you, what students don't do is take the trouble to research the places that they're going to apply to because they need to understand where they're going. If you were moving in to um, a flat with someone, you would take the trouble to work out something about them. It's the same because you're making a commitment to spend a good part of your life with a group of strangers. So research that set of chambers, look up their maternity policy, have a look and see if they've got any women in high positions. See if there are any faces that aren't pink, um, that aren't called Fortescue Smythe, that seem to have a history um, that involves not being at Oxford every day of the blessed week. There are some sets of chambers that have no one in them other than people who've been to Oxford. Um, I'm not going to get in there. I would never have got in there. I would never bother applying. There are other sets of chambers who have hunting, fishing, shooting people, whether well, that's marvelous, on you go. But again, it's not going to be somewhere for me. So find your own place, find a set of chambers that is going to help you develop. And that may be the beauty of a virtual set of chambers where because of the pandemic, all of a sudden, something that Stephen was doing already is now becoming something that people are copying and flattery and all that and imitation, but it is something that people are copying. And you need to look, the bar doesn't start and end in London. There are lovely sets of chambers all around the regions. You don't have to move to London to be at the bar. You don't have to stay in London if you have decided to have a family and you want to have your practice somewhere. But what you must do is decide what you want to do, what your compromise is, and never feel less than because you've chosen to do the best job in the world. Because having children is the best job in the world. And the day job is the means by which we can fund the children that we have produced and also to demonstrate to them just where you can go if you have intellect, ability and stubbornness. So we are here to try and help the next generation not to have to have such a journey as the journey that we had. And we can only do that if you ask us or if you enable us to help you. And so what I would say is use us. We've, we've done it, we've survived, we are shining examples of the fact that you can do it. So just use us and have the very best career ever. Because the one real great thing about being a woman in this job is you're not judged on your looks, you don't get too old, and you get to wear school uniform for the rest of your life and not have to worry about what you wear when you go to work or your hair. What more can anybody want? Thank you, Mary. And Nelly, I'm going to come over to you, some words of wisdom. So 
I find the hardest bar, part of being at the bar is that dichotomy where you're in a profession where some people expect you to have a wife full time at home doing everything. And when you turn up at the school gate, well, actually, you know, if you make it to the school gate, <laughs> then school expects you to be at home the whole time and able to drop everything at a moment's notice to run whatever kits or whatever they've forgotten. Um, so it's managing that dichotomy uh, is the key, I think, because that's the most stressful element. And like Mary, I would echo when I go to sixth form um, schools and I say, talk to particularly girls, I say, um, look, you've got to choose your workplace as though it was your family. It's really important that when the chips are down and something goes wrong, you've got a really strong network behind you. But on the same line, your most important decision in life is your partner. You've got to choose your partner, aside from all the romantic love and everything else, but they have to be your business partner as well, that they're going to give you the support at home. And I would not have managed anything that I've achieved if it hadn't been the fact that I'd ignored the alpha males and I'd gone for somebody who genuinely loves me and is willing to support me in a profession that I feel so passionate about. And I felt so lucky during the pandemic because obviously we had homeschooling, we were juggling everything else, but my husband was fully hands-on as much as I was. And I'm talking to other female, um, not just lawyers, but other, you know, everyone doing, the, doing that juggle. I felt very lucky and um, and and also uh, he's recently lost his job and for the first time in my life I realised what it's like to have somebody at home who is doing more than 50% and I think that is the norm for most of the bar so I do think there is a message there for both clerks and male practitioners that the only way that women are going to to achieve and to achieve and, make, and stay at the bar is if men pull their weight at home as well and support um, their, their wives in their careers. The, the, second, the next point I would like to make is, is not just um, about coming to the bar and entry, but actually maintaining um, women at the bar. And to me, that has to be a wholesale change in leadership. And I'm not, I'm not just talking um, in terms of the heads of the bar, I'm talking on a day-to-day -day case management basis. I was involved in a major case last year where we had a team of 14 and 11 of the 14 were female. All 14 of us had ch children and we managed to devise a rota. So it was an expedited trial. We did three years of litigation in nine months, but we actually drew up a rota with the silks and the junior juniors to say, right, who's got this school concert? Who's got that parents meeting? Let's work out a rota to cover for one another. And on all my cases that I do where I have particularly junior females, but also young male pa uh, parents, I'm devising the strategy for the case and how we're running the deadlines so that one of us is covering for the other. And if it's a matter of me filling in while a junior has to go to a medical appointment or for a child or for a parent's meeting, we, we, there's flexibility there. And, and that is a neighbor, those small things on a day-to-day -day basis, basis make a massive difference to, to senior retention. And the leadership goes beyond just case management but as I said creating opportunities for women to progress and mentoring through the various stages of their career whether it's applying to government panels whether it's applying for silk it's highlighting those junior females and saying look here are the guy ropes I'm not going to take you down to the pub I'm not going to take you to the football but here are the things that help me on my way and let, let me help you show you the route through um, so it's really that sort of kindness between different members of the bar that the bar is so so well renowned for that needs to be shown on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you Anneli and Charlotte. Um, I think I would echo entirely what um, Anneli has just said about choosing the right partner um, and I think my last decade couldn't be any more crystal clear about that in terms of my own personal experience. I would say that the difference between my first and second marriages was something probably along the lines of having my ankle strapped to the Titanic um, and trying to keep above water like this um, for the first half of the decade. And then the second half of the decade was like having the, the, the cord pulled on my life raft um, because my my husband now um, gave up his 23 year career in the police um, to look after the children, um, including mine, the two children that aren't even his. Um, and I can tell you that my career and my earning capacity 
um, compared to prior to that is is absolutely and completely unparalleled. Um, so I've definitely noticed and can support that comment that it really can come down to something as fundamental as that is is just having that support at home, particularly if you've got children, actually. Um, it's really, really important. But equally, um, you know, sometimes things don't quite work out the way we had hoped <laughs> at the very beginning. And of course, nobody goes into a bad marriage knowing it's going to be a bad marriage and they're going to be faced with all these difficulties. Um, but I think that general message is, look, perhaps even if you have that sit down conversation with your partner, um, whoever they may be, to say, look, this is the career path I want. It's going to be tough. Are you up for it? Um, and perhaps even putting it in your vows, I don't know, you know, I'm going to be in court really late. Do you promise to go and get the children if I WhatsApp you under the table from court? Um, I do. Um, you know, great, go for it. But I think they have to have a real honest conversation about a relationship when you when you have a career like this. Um, but equally, you know, if you if, if, if you want to, I know a couple of messages in the chat room about trying to keep things a bit apart. Not some people don't want silk. Some people don't want the judicial appointments. Some people don't want the big cases and that's fine too. There are plenty of barristers in my chambers who are quite happy at 20 years call to be going, just doing the odd hearing down the road. You know, that's fine as well. You can still be a barrister. You don't have to be Kavala QC. You know, you, you, can, you can still be a barrister and not be, um, have big grandiose ambitions. That's fine as well, actually. So, um, decide what you want and see if you can achieve it and work with your partner um and um yeah so that, that I, I totally echo what the others have said about that thanks charlotte and finally tahina i'm just gonna add a few things to what everyone has said um i echo everything i'm gonna say the bar is hugely flexible it has positives we can have a really flexible career and it's well paying whatever area of law you do we've got to remember that we're told at times you know it's not well paying it is it you can have, it's a pretty good job um, in terms of planning, what I would say is you just need to think about things and plan ahead, such as childcare. Think about what, how you're going to do that. Is it going to be, do you have family around? We didn't have any family. Do you need an au pair? Do you need a nanny? And a lot of the bar do have au pairs or, or do you want someone living? How are you going to manage that? So have your planning. Um, something I, I nanny said about, um, well, uh, it's about having those um, dichotomy between sort of childcare and, uh, and work. I attended a, a workplace uh, anxiety webinar the other day uh, and I thought, I, I said, my anxiety isn't forgetting my trousers the next day or waking up uh, with those dreams. It's, have I remembered it's non-school uniform day? Uh, and it's those sort of things. It's just planning your time and managing things. So those are things I, I worry about. Um, I agree with Mary as well about finding the right chambers. I did exactly what she said. I looked through the chamber site and I said, is there anyone that looks like me? In those sets I, and it is those sort of things that you think about i was very lucky that i obtained um, pupillage fairly early on in my search but find the right place and that's one of the reasons i am in the regional sets that i am and i have been because that worked for me uh, in terms of our childcare and our um lifestyle so and finally just to bring stephen into this i absolutely agree as far as your clerks talk to them the away away we all hear this i make sure i put down it's my child's birthday which means do not offer me work do not offer me that twenty thousand pound brief because i might be tempted because that's what we barristers do but if you don't ask me i won't say um yes I that's it so make sure you're clear and if you're away on holiday and you don't want to um be disturbed and you're with your children for family time just make it absolutely clear because we are are terrible. We say we're away, but oh, please check whether if something um, decent comes in, we, we may be tempted and we're really bad at saying no. So I would say talk to your clerks, plan, and it's a great job, flexible, and it's well paid. Come and join us. Thank you, everyone. And unfortunately, that is all we have time for this evening. So a very special thank to all of my guests this evening, Anneli Howard QC, Charlotte Davis, Tahina Akta, Dermot Keaton, Stephen Ward and Mary Pryor UC. So do keep an eye out for future Aspiring Bar Barrister events. And of course, you can feel free to contact um, Aspiring Barristers on LinkedIn and social media and connect with us. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, Clara. Bye -bye. Thank you.